A Ride to Remember, a Civil Rights Story, written by Sharon Langley and Amy Nathan, illustrated by Floyd Cooper. I love carousels. The horses come in so many colors, black, white, brown, gray, a honey shade of tan, sunny yellow, fire engine red, or even a soft baby blue. But no matter their colors, the horses all go at the same speed as they circle round and round. They start together. They finish together too. Nobody is first and nobody is last. Everyone is equal when you ride a carousel. When I was a very little girl, my family lived in Baltimore. Near our house was an amusement park. It was green and grassy, big and beautiful, bright and shiny. There were rides and games treats and cold drinks at Gwyn Oak Amusement Park, and a carousel too. But before I was born, there were no rides or sweets at that park for children like me. Was it because kids didn't have money to buy tickets? I asked Mama. No, it wasn't about money, said Mama. Or was it because they lived too far away from the park? I asked. That wasn't the problem either, said Daddy. Then why? I wondered aloud. It was because of an unfair rule the park had, Daddy explained. The rule said that African Americans couldn't go on any of the rides. Could we go there to have a picnic or fly a kite? I asked. No, we couldn't, said Mama. We wouldn't have been welcome there, said Daddy. That's terrible, I said. Yes, it was, Mama said. It was segregation, keeping people apart because of their race. Treating people differently because of the color of their skin, Daddy added. What about the golden rule? I asked. What about treating other people the way you want to be treated? I guess some people forgot that the golden rule is, suppo is supposed to include everyone, said Mama. For a long time, black and white kids couldn't do many things together. They couldn't go to the same schools or to the same restaurants and libraries or even sit together at the movies. It was the law. Why didn't somebody do something about those kinds of laws? I asked. They did, said Mama. We did, said Daddy. Many people, both blacks and whites, knew that segregation was unfair and just plain wrong. Some people said, just wait, times will change. But others said, why wait? What's wrong with now? They held protests at restaurants, stores, and movie theaters. They tried to get officials and courts to make new laws to create a better city, a place that would welcome and include all people. By the time I was born, some unfair laws had changed in Baltimore. Kids could go to the same schools and libraries, restaurants, and some movie theaters too, no matter the color of their skin. But the amusement park just wouldn't budge, said Daddy. People who were fed up with segregation made plans to hold a huge protest at the amusement park. They spread the word to churches, synagogues, schools, and other places in the community so that many people could take part in the protest. They invited newspapers and television stations to report on the protest. They told the police chief about their plans so the police could keep peace. Best of all, they picked a perfect summer day for the big event, a day when people celebrate what's best about America said Mama. What day do you think they chose? The 4th of July, I said. That's right, a day that stands for freedom, said Mama. Did they have fireworks? I asked. They had something even better. Hundreds of people, black and white, young and old, students, teachers, priests, ministers, and rabbis, all came together on July 4th, 1963, to take part in one of the biggest protests the city ever had said Daddy. They believed in the golden rule, that being fair is the right thing to do, said Mama. First, the protesters went to a church to pray, sing freedom songs, and get ready. They spent the morning learning how to be peaceful protesters, how not to use their fists to fight back. Then they climbed onto buses to go to the amusement park. They brought signs and banners that declared their message of fairness for all. When the protesters reached the park, a crowd of angry faces greeted them, people who didn't want the park to change. They shouted insults at the protesters. The protesters just held their signs high and sang freedom songs. We shall overcome. The civil rights anthem filled the air, said Daddy. 
But when they tried to go into the park to buy tickets, blacks and whites together, the park's owners had the protesters arrested, said Mama. So they did what they had been taught to do, to protest peacefully. Some sat on the ground and refused to move. Police officers had to carry them to buses to take them to the police station. Mama and Daddy explained that almost 300 protesters were arrested that day. Some paid a fine and could go home, but half refused to pay their fines. They chose to spend the night in jail instead. When they went home the next day, they began planning another protest for two days later, on July 7th. Kids help too, Mama said. A newspaper reporter even asked 11-year-old Lydia Finney and her aunt Mabel Grant to go on a secret protest at the park. They both had light-colored skin. He thought the park's ticket taker might not know they were black. On the morning of the second protest, Lydia and her aunt walked up to the ticket booth. They bought tickets and walked right in. They could have been arrested if anybody found out they were who they were, but nobody noticed. They stayed for two hours and went on some rides, including the carousel. When they left, the protesters weren't there yet, but the reporter was. He interviewed them and wrote about their visit to show what a mistake it is to judge people by the color of their skin. When the protesters arrived for the second protest, people arrest, police arrested nearly 100 protesters, blacks and whites, who tried to enter the park together. Among the youngest taken to the police station were three young white boys who joined the protest with their parents. Tom, John, and Steve Coleman. Photos of those boys and their parents being arrested and put in a police car appeared in newspapers the next day. Those photos shocked many people, said Mama, arresting a family for trying to ride a carousel. Ridiculous, I said. Exactly, said Mama. The stories about the protests in newspapers and on television made more people decide that segregation had to go. So many people spoke out against the park that its owners saw that they had to change. The park's owners agreed to let everyone come to the park, no matter their skin color. All arrest charges were against a ch all arrest charges against the protesters were dropped too. The first day Gwyn Oak Amusement Park was open to all was August 28, 1963, one month before my first birthday. Mama told me that at first she was afraid to take me to the park. Would we be safe? Would we be arrested? But she and Daddy decided that it was important for us to be there that first day, as a family. On August 28, 1963, we were the first African-American family to walk into Gwyn Oak Amusement Park when it was open to all. No angry faces greeted us, only smiling news reporters and photographers who rushed around us. Daddy said he marched me straight over to the carousel. He helped me onto a big, smiling horse. He put his arm around me and held my hand so I wouldn't be afraid. Mama stood nearby, waving. Photographers jumped onto the ride with us. They took photos of Daddy and me because I was the first African-American child to go on a ride that day. Before the carousel started turning, white kids climbed on the, to the horses beside me. They were big kids and probably ride by themselves but one girl's mother asked Daddy to keep an eye on her daughter to make sure she didn't fall off her horse. Daddy was glad to help. He kept watch on all us kids, keeping all of us safe. The next day, newspapers had stories about my carousel ride. There was my name, Sharon Langley, right in the newspaper. There were photos of Daddy and me and of the other kids riding with me. It had been a big new day for everyone who was at the amusement park with us. August 28th was also an important day for a man who was trying to end unfair rules everywhere, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. On that very day, Dr. King was at a huge protest in Washington, the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. Hundreds of thousands of people joined him to call for an end to segregation everywhere. Dr. King told the crowd that, about his hopes and dreams that one day black children and white children would live together peacefully in this country treating each other as brothers and sisters. My carousel ride showed that Dr. King's dream was starting to come true. That was a long time ago. The amusement park isn't there anymore. A big storm destroyed many of the rides and Gwyn Oak Amusement Park had to close. Now it's a park where families have picnics on sunny afternoons and where neighborhood kids play ball. 
On its green grassy fields stand a sign to help people remember those who took a stand for justice there. The carousel came through the storm just fine and was moved to Washington DC on the National Mall. It's fitting that it should be there near the monuments that stand for freedom not far from the Lincoln Memorial, where Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. stood to give his famous speech during the March on Washington. My name, Sharon Langley, was put on one horse's saddle and on one of its horseshoes too. A sign on the carousel's fence tells about my ride to remember on that sunny August day so long ago. Today, big kids, little kids, young kids, old kids, no matter the color of their skin, can ride on any carousel, going round and round on horses painted all the colors of the rainbow. Nobody first and nobody last, everyone equal, having fun together.